we are here today to answer any questions that you might have via the chat function and in the Q and A part we have dedicated some time at or for um, at the end of the webinar. And uh, we have today with us Claire and Matthijs for the general blueprint introduction and for the presentation of the building blocks. And Bert then will give us a will guide us through the glossary and the conceptual model. Uh, but first, I want to directly hand over to Boris for introductory words from the coordinator of the DSSC project. And I hope you will enjoy today's DSSC Insight Series. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Francisca, and also a very warm welcome from my side to everybody who's attending. Um, Francisca already mentioned that. Um, today is basically fully devoted to the Data Spaces Support Center Blueprint. Um, the Blueprint, along with its ingredients, I would call it, has been published in the version 0.5 um, by the end of last month. And we are very proud of it as a project and also very happy that we met this milestone because this is an important step in our endeavor to support data space endeavors. That's the ultimate, uh, the ultimate uh, a goal that we want to pursue. And um, when I say we, of course, that means that it's not only, of course, our project um, consortium, but as you know, the Data Space Support Center um, is a collaborative endeavor. And I'd like to stress that because lots of people have been participating and contributing in the uh, current version of the blueprint, which is the spirit that we would like to also to keep up, right? Because in the end, we have a, well, once in a decade, perhaps once in a lifetime opportunity to define, let's say, what we find right and useful and appropriate when it comes to, well, how should a data space look like and what uh, is the cook recipe for a data space. And to put that a little bit into context and not order to take too much time from Claire, Matthijs and Bert, um, I would like to ask to move to the next slide exactly. And uh, what I would like to do is once more put um, the blueprint a little bit into the context of the um, overall uh, landscape of assets that we as the DSSC uh, project are delivering to our users. So basically our stakeholders and in particular the data space uh, initiatives that are out there in order to well, take up on these um, blueprints and assets and uh, use them for their own projects. Um, I think this um, model has been shown a couple of times. Um, as you can see, um, there are a lot of things that basically represent this cook recipe, to call it like that. Um, but these are also accompanied by a number of, let's say, supportive assets. Um, Francisca mentioned that Bert will also um, walk a little bit through the glossary and sometimes um, you might say ah what is the glossary all about why can't we look it up in wikipedia so there is already something um, but let's face it um, we are here all together to make the european strategy on data happen and um, an integral part of the european strategy on data is data spaces and um, as you also are aware of, there are a number of data spaces um, called for, so-called common European data spaces, but they will not just be implemented with, let's say, one large project team which sits in Brussels and then does it all, for example, for the mobility uh, domain. No, the, 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 the contrast, the opposite is true. Um, there will be a lot of, let's say, initiatives in the mobility domain in the different member states with different speeds. Uh, which eventually then form the overall mobility data space in Europe. And um, this will only happen, well, if we use common terminology, if we understand each other and are able to, well, um, um, to, to contribute to a, to a shared goal. And therefore, things like a glossary, but also a conceptual model are of so high importance because otherwise we will just, you know, um, end up in a situation like it was um, with the Tower of, of Babel, where basically nobody understood each other and then we will not miss, let's, uh, then we will not achieve our mission to, um, to accomplish uh, common European data spaces. And this is why it's so important, because if we have common ground in terms of um, terminology, concepts, and also what are the, well, the ingredients of the blueprint uh, of the data space cook recipe, only then we can basically 
bring it together and, as I said, achieve our mission. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, um, that is only not only a prerequisite for, let's say, well, a common language and common ground, but also it helps out the individual data space initiatives. And I just prepared uh, three major areas of benefits that these blueprints bring to every individual data space initiative. First, I mean, what we do is basically, and that is also why I mentioned it's a collaborative endeavor, we looked into all the different places where data spaces are um, already running or are about to be established and try to identify those things that basically work, right? So, and which makes sense together. And the good news for all the data space initiatives out there is, well, that has already been done, right? So you don't need to do that on your own. And that is of benefit for you because you just save time. And saving time means you will be increasing, let's say, um, or uh, be more effective when it comes to time to value. So you will be able to, um, to achieve your mission earlier as if we would not have a blueprint. The other thing um, that um, comes along with the blueprints is a reduction of, let's say, risk of failure. Because let's face it, data spaces are still a, a very new animal in the room, so to say. And uh, in many cases, um, we all together are stepping into uncharted territory. And the risk then, or the likelihood is high <clears throat> that we forget important things, right? Um, and that is something that we can mitigate by looking into all the different pieces and ingredients, as I mentioned them for the cook recipe that have been put into place in other cases and helped to make their um, data space initiatives a success. And once more, um, we are in Europe and um, not only do we speak all different languages when it comes to just verbal communication, um, yeah, I mean, you all know the saying that the most spoken language in the world is poor English, of course, but I don't want to elaborate on that. But in terms of, let's say, the, um, the, the common ground for fundamentals of data spaces, we must um, find uh, a common terminology and common uh, conceptual understanding and also a common, well, or a, a, a mutual agreement about the mental models that we have in our minds. And once more, um, and then I would like to also hand over to, to, to Claire Matthijs, but to, to, to add this on the last point in common language. Um, I mean, what we all observe is, let's say, that um, data space project teams consist of a variety of different people with different skills and different backgrounds. At least we can identify um, guys which come from just technology. So, oh yeah, I have, let's say, you know, this kind of um, uh, catalog standard and this is a cool thing. Then we have, let's say, people from the business domain who basically know how an end-to-end -end mobility service should look like, but are not so concerned so much with uh, technology. And then, at least we have um, people who double check whether everything that's basically done there with um, using data together is legal and how we can govern it, so to say, and that it's also in line with the, in particular, the European regulation of um, uh, for, for the data economy. And if we do not find common ground in the words we use, we will just misunderstand each other. And that will basically also lead to the fact that many of the initiatives will be put at risk. So that is why it's important. And with that, I would like to close my, my little introduction. Um, I'm happy to be here today. As I said, it's a, it's a big milestone for us. Of course, the work has not been finished. I'd like to say that as well. Uh, that is also the reason that is what I forgot to mention why we labeled it 0.5. Um, so everybody who con contributed to it in the past is heavily invited to keep up that spirit and do that also for the next version. And with that, I'd like to hand over to, to Claire and Matthijs. Thank, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Um, and uh, let me reiterate just what you said. Uh, I, I, also from, from, from here, a big thank you to everyone who has contributed uh, to, uh, uh, to, to the Blueprint as it is uh, today, be it through an expert group, a thematic group, a wider community of practice, or as a strategic stakeholder in the DSSC. Um, we've really been working very hard in the past few months uh, with this wide community to uh, come up with this initial preliminary uh, blueprint. Um, 
And I would like to actually start off by saying a few things what we have heard very often. Um, and that is that people want to get to a higher flight level much more quickly. Um, so we had uh, a number of coordination support actions in a number of um, uh, industrial areas that said, well, we have very limited time to set up uh, and start a, a data space or to uh, investigate what initiatives are out there for our sector. And we need to get to that higher flight level that brings value to the society or their business much more quickly than we could uh, in the past. Uh, so we need to have those common standards, uh, those, those basic technological and business uh, uh, elements, we need to have them in place so that we can focus on uh, uh, the things that, that matter to us most, that is to provide the business value or the societal value in that, uh, in that domain. So that has really driven uh, our work uh, compiling this, uh, uh, this blueprint. Um, and many of you, uh, also involved from a technology perspective. And so we, we've talked to many software companies and standardization initiatives um, uh, or open source initiatives uh, that are building software for, for data spaces. Um, and for that, it is important to build a bigger market. So if we have common standards, if we have this common language, if we have common approaches, then we can also provide those organizations with a, a bigger market. Uh, and that solutions become available more as a service, they require less implementation effort. Um, and then we can hopefully, at, at the end of the day, also create some economies of, uh, of, of scale for technology providers. And for participants in a data space, uh, we can create a network effect. Um, uh, so we're now seeing the first examples where our organizations say, well, I'm active in a particular domain, let's say a mobility. Uh, but I also need to be active in another domain, let's say uh, energy. Um, uh, and, and what can I do? What investments can I do so that I can easily join data spaces in different uh, uh, domains? So it's really also about that, that network effect and the additional value that we can then uh, provide. Um, and so... When, when, when looking at blueprints, we, we, we need to make sure that we also enable data space initiatives uh, to work uh, together and to really enable organizations to participate in different initiatives, but at the same time also to maintain data sovereignty. So that everyone, even if you're active in different regions or different domains, or if you're providing technology to uh, uh, different uh, data spaces, that you remain uh, sovereign. That was also uh, a leading theme in many of the discussions that we've had uh, in the past few months. Um, so in practice, what we have done uh, is we've collected the input from um, uh, the data space initiatives, first of all, in the Digital Europe uh, program. Um, you know, a number of uh, priority domains were selected uh, there. Uh, there were investments in coordination and support actions. There are now further actions uh, for, the, for the deployment in those uh, initiatives, and they were bundled in our community of, of practice. Um, then on the technology side, we said, well, we do not want to reinvent the wheel again. Uh, there are already a number of uh, leading initiatives uh, in Europe that provide technology, that provide standards, uh, that have also started to actively work together to make sure that those standards can work uh, together uh, so that you can have a data space connector which works in the cloud, which can use uh, identity and which can uh, then uh, uh, use a smart data API, all these things. Uh, they are working together and we have worked with them and we, we've been looking into, okay, what can we, can we take from those initiatives and provide to, uh, to a wider uh, community? Um, and we were also able to build on uh, existing materials. So, for instance, the Open DEI project, um, uh, which, which is probably familiar to a large uh, uh, number of people joining today as well. We've said, well, we, we will not reinvent the wheel there again. So, if you think about building blocks uh, for data spaces, we start with what Open DEI has already provided to, to us, and then we will work uh, from there. Um, so that, this is what we did do, but this is also still a bit what we are doing. Uh, so as Boris just mentioned, this is the 0.5 version. It's a preliminary, pre preliminary uh, version. 
Uh, and for us, it also serves uh, as a way to identify further needs, gaps, and potentially solutions in a dialogue with a wider audience. So we will continue the work that we've been doing so far with our existing community. And we also invite others to uh, reflect on our work and provide us with ideas, thoughts, and suggestions uh, on how to move forward so that in the beginning of uh, next year, we can release uh, the formal version, the 1.0 version of the blueprint. Um, zooming in a little bit more to the, to the structure, um, then the blueprint actually consists of a number of different elements. And if you go to our website, you will also recognize uh, those. Um, so one thing uh, is that we said we, we need to have a common language. Uh, so we have a glossary of common terms uh, that are being used in uh, data spaces as well as a conceptual model. And uh, Bert Verdonk, who will join us in a moment, will talk more about uh, that. Then after that, we, we uh, have said we need to look into the capabilities that data spaces need. Uh, capabilities both on a business and organizational level, as well as on the technological level. Um, we call them building blocks. We'll show them uh, in a moment. Um, uh, so we've identified these capabilities, but we've also looked into the specifications that apply for each of those uh, uh, capabilities. Um, so. For some of the building blocks, we can provide those specifications today as a start. For others, we will uh, do that uh, in the 1.0 version, um, uh, but that's now available uh, as well. Um, and we aim to provide a bit of an overarching view. So how, how does this then all work uh, uh, together? So we will take you through uh, all of this uh, in, in the webinar. Um, and maybe to, to start, uh, I would actually like to hand over to Bert Verdonk. Um, hopefully he has also joined us by now Yes, absolutely. Uh, to discuss with us the glossary and conceptual model. So Bert, the floor is yours. Yes, absolutely. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Well, thank you, Matthijs. Um, so actually the two topics that I can talk about were already introduced by the speakers. So that's good. You have uh, given me an initial uh, starting point already. Um, and they are also quite uh, foundational. So let me first talk about the glossary in the next slide. Um, it's actually there. And uh, you will see that this is already reached version 2.0. Uh, so this has a longer history already. We actually started working on this glossary already in the writing of the, the consortium proposal, eh? because already then the participants, we were 12 consortium partners and then some additional uh, uh, contributors also, we already felt the need that we need to unify our language. If you want to collaborate on a consistent set of documents and texts, you want consistency in the language that is used across these documents, otherwise your reader is quickly confused. So we absolutely needed this already uh, just within the consortium. And then in our interactions with the various data space initiatives as well, um, you can very rapidly get confused about, um, uh, about what people are talking about. So with, with all of these um, uh, stakeholders, we needed also to unify our language and our concept. So that's what the glossary is for. Um, what we also noticed is that many disciplines are involved in the definition and the creation of a data space and then in the implementation and the operation of it, many disciplines are involved. Just think uh, on the larger scale, um, the business stakeholders, uh, the legal representatives, as well as the technical um, uh, specialists that are implementing the thing. Um, these people need to collaborate across their functional borders. So the, the glossary is also a place where we try to make a common language between these different uh, disciplines. You can see from the left that uh, we have now 10 chapters and an introduction in this uh, uh, glossary document. Um, um, and so there is a bit of a logical buildup and structure in the terms. On total, I think we have around 150 terms defined in this, in this work. This will further evolve. It's not the end game and we will continue to follow uh, the developments of the, of the assets of the DSCC and support it with uh, further gradually evolving language. On the other hand, we have reached version 2.0. So we hope also that there is some stability now here in these um, terms and in this terminology so that we can all together start to use it and apply it consistently. 
So I think with this version 2.0, we are really inviting everyone to start really practicing this and using the common language um, in their uh, in their interactions, in the workshops, in the expert groups, um, and use this language uh, consistently wherever that is useful. Um, one more word is that people can get quite um, fanatic and emotional about terminology, and there is no absolute wrong or right in defining a term. A term serves a purpose. A term serves to get uh, educate a dialogue between participants. So it's the participants that need to agree for their context what is um, a practical uh, language here, what is a practical vocabulary for all our collaboration to work. So we had at many, many times we had to also temper a bit the expectation and ask people to compromise to say, hey, can this be the common language for us to make our collaboration work? Um, just very uh, rapidly reflecting on the structure here, uh, chapter one, actually, which I've not uh, a screenshot, I we invite you to, of course, to explore it through the uh, DSSC website. But the first chapter really grounds us in the European data strategy. They provide the foundation elements, which we have not invented. We have copied them and referenced them in the various um, uh, documents from the European Commission, in their working documents, from their presentations, from the uh, legal acts also, the GDPR, the Data Governance Act, the Data Act have, uh, and several other acts have, have quite clear definition sections. And there we have made a summary of the most relevant terms that have already been defined. And we use those as the starting point. From there, we move on in section two, very important, the core concepts. And that's where you will see on the screen also the data space itself being defined, probably the most debated term. Um, but the data space term, we have a working definition now here. Um, you see it on the screen and you will find it back uh, throughout uh, the further assets of, uh, of our work. And um, then uh, moving further, we have looked into use cases, business models, how data spaces evolve and develop over time, a dedicated section on intermediaries, um, the concept of data products and data services are explained, core terms for interoperability, data policies, contracts, identity and trust. So those are the main chapters of where the participants felt we need to define common language. So once again, I, we believe that a, a good foundation is here. It will not be final. We will continue to evolve it, but we believe that we have a very good starting set of terminology defined and usable. Um, the glossary remains open for feedback and absolutely we will want to further evolve it. Some works in progress is that we will want to add uh, um, some more descriptive uh, explanations to some terms. So we try to keep the terms and the definitions quite short, but sometimes that doesn't do full justice to the, the richness of a term and the various needs and usages of the term in uh, different contexts. So, so there will we will continue to add further explanatory notes uh, in order to further enrich this uh, this vocabulary. Then I want to move uh, further to the next uh, slide also, which is the conceptual model. So the con so the terms is nice, but the terms and terminology does not fully um, describe the relationship between these concepts. And that's where the conceptual model comes in. So that's where we try to create um, a, a clear structure, a relationship between these core uh, terms. Um, you will see also multiplicity between the terms, uh, one uh, data space, um, may be defined and may utilize multiple data space infrastructures, for example. You see in these conceptual model diagrams that there are relationships def defined between the concepts and uh, multiplicities between the terms. Core here again is the data space as the starting point, but the data space is, does not live in isolation. The data space is created in a context and the data space serves a purpose. Uh, it serves use cases and it defines data products which can be transacted between participants and when you start talking about a data space like that you start to see the relationship between these core concepts and that is really where this base level conceptual model is about it actually defines all the key uh, objects or the key terms that are used also in the data space definition if you scroll back later or if you scroll to the glossary you will see and you read the data space definition, all the terms actually used there come back to this uh, uh, basic conceptual model. 
Now, that being said, um, and, and this is a very important starting point and a unifying model where all of the um, data space building blocks that uh, Matthijs and Claire will talk about later use as a starting point. Um, we've also worked already on a uh, more granular level, because you can all see from this slide, that's pretty high level, that's pretty conceptual level. Um, there is absolutely need to go also deeper in a more granular level. So each of these boxes has already been detailed out in a, in a, a more detailed conceptual model. We've, however, chosen not yet to publish it because we felt this was not very mature yet. So we're inviting the audience and the collaborators here to also help us get to the next level of these conceptual models. We call them uh, level two. And we would love in the uh, next version 1.0 uh, next year that we can also publish uh, the next level uh, conceptual models, which uh, will become really practical, more detailed um, information models uh, that are uh, fully used and, and practiced in the various building blocks. So if you uh, flip to my last slide, that uh, um, demonstrates a bit what we should, what we want to work on in the next steps. Um, we also see there is a potentially a need for a level zero or an overarching view. So that is uh, something we have sketches of. Uh, of uh, a, a single data space actually may live in a setting where there are multiple data spaces active. So there is uh, federations of data spaces have been talked about. So where do we describe that? There's also a more a holistic concept of a data ecosystem uh, where the data space is just one element from. So there is room for defining that level zero overarching view. And then what I already said, there is uh, room for a level two with more uh, detailed um, uh, development or folding out each concept uh, to the next level. And then again, of course, summarizing that in an explosion view. So all these detailed level two models together should be consistent can be interrelated and uh, can be. So that will become uh, more than can fit on a page. Eh? We may go to a larger um, a screen size also to show that explosion uh, model, but that is uh, what we're working on. So today published, you will find um, the level one published. Works in progress are the level zero and the level two. And we invite um, the community to help us further uh, develop these conceptual models. Please give us also feedback about what works, what doesn't work with this level of uh, conceptual models because we're happy to further adjust our format and our way of working. But for now, it works as a, as a foundation for um, the further definitions and work in the building block teams. And now I hand it back to Matej and Claire to explore those building blocks. Very good. Uh, thank you, Bert. So uh, we will now move on to the data spaces building blocks. Um, I move back to the uh, asset model and um, what we will now do is focus more on um, uh, the technical and the organizational and uh, business building blocks. Uh, what is a, a building block? A building block is also defined in uh, the glossary that uh, Bert was just uh, uh, presenting. And it's a basic unit or component that can be implemented or a capability that can be deployed and combined with other building blocks. Um, so, um, and then of course in the data space uh, context. And that means that these are uh, key capabilities um, that a data space needs. And it's not just a software component that you can download and install. Um, and as I mentioned, we have two type of building block categories um, that we will further explain now. And I will start with uh, business governance and uh, legal building blocks. And after that, Matthijs will explain the technical building blocks. Did, these are uh, the building blocks uh, together as you will find them uh, at this moment uh, in the current blueprint uh, version. Um, and the green building blocks have three pillars uh, focusing on business, governance, and legal. They are in total uh, eight building blocks and uh, nine at the technical side. Um, so I will move to the next slide. Um, I start with the four uh, business building blocks um, that we uh, brought in, and these are actually the important ingredients to create uh, for a, a data space uh, at the business side. Um, essential concepts in, in the business modeling. And uh, to support a data space in the business model, um, we provide with the business model building block 
uh, actually uh, guidance in uh, decision making uh, around participants, around value propositions, but also the revenue and the cost model of a data space. Um, and that also relates to what will data space do in-house and what will be outsourced. Um, also part of this is a use case, data space use case development. And with that, um, actually a strategic approach is provided to strengthen the value of a data space. Um, and this building block supports in creating um, use cases and also supporting and scaling them. Another building block at the business side uh, is the data product, also uh, mentioned by uh, Bert. And then we focus particularly on the development. Um, and important uh, elements that the building block provides are, for instance, templates for data providers, uh, data space governance rules, also to stimulate the network effects between, at one hand, uh, data uh, providers, but also the users. The fourth building block that focus on uh, data space uh, intermediaries, which is actually an important role in a data space. And um, that provides uh, data space enabling services to the data space uh, governance authority, but also to other participants um, like uh, the identity, like observability, uh, but also the catalog and connector services. Now I move on to the uh, governance building blocks. Here we have uh, two at the moment. Uh, these are organizational governance and data sharing governance. Um, the organizational uh, governance is um, focusing on guiding in, in setting up uh, the data space governance authority um, by identifying key decision points and options for establishing uh, an inclusive governance. And with an inclusive governance, we mean that we incorporate and involve the relevant uh, data space uh, uh, participants and partners. And that also requires transparent rules and roles and responsibilities. For the uh, data sharing governance, um, that building block supports the governance authority and especially in establishing common rules uh, to promote effective but also reliable uh, data sharing processes. Um, to organize the data transactions actually in a uh, transparent way. Then we also um, created two uh, legal building blocks uh, to provide guidance uh, to um, yeah, show what the requirements are uh, for a data space to really become legally compliant uh, and to become aligned with European values. Um, and next to that, we also have the building block uh, providing the contractual framework to establish uh, a clear um, enforceable rights and also indicate obligations for the data space participants um, that needs to be also incorporated in contracts um, to indicate uh, yeah, what the, the contractual resources are for the data space participants to regulate their data transactions in a proper way. Um, well, of course, as uh, mentioned uh, by um, the former uh, people uh, who also uh, presented all the elements of our uh, blueprint, of course, we are not there yet. We will continue our work uh, on the blueprint. We will, for instance, look at whether there are building blocks missing. We will also uh, dive deeper into the uh, context um, to provide more content. Uh, for each of the building blocks. And we will also focus in the next version more on the interrelations between the organizational and business building blocks, but also uh, the technical building blocks. Um, I would like to leave it here. And of course, uh, all your input is welcome in these next steps. And I would like to give uh, the floor back to Matthijs. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just uh, to reiterate, um, if I still recall the, uh, the OpenDI model, uh, we just had one pillar, state and governance, and, and as you can see, given the importance of this uh, this element, we now have three pillars with way more building blocks, and, and we ought to really work on, on that. 
in that sense, uh, for the technical part, we uh, had it a bit easier in the sense that OpenDI was already way more elaborate on the technical building blocks that would be needed for, for data spaces. So we retained the three pillars that uh, OpenDI uh, has already provided uh, to us. Um, but our challenge was mainly to identify more content. So uh, the, the categories were there, but what is now in each of those uh, building blocks? So that was the discussion on the technical side. And to zoom in a little bit, uh, the three pillars, uh, so data interoperability, which is about making sure that uh, data is interoperable between all participants of uh, a data space. We have a common shared language and that data which flows from one system to the other, from one participant to the other, um, uh, is uh, understandable and can be interpreted and can be processed. So this is the first pillar, and I will dive deeper in the building blocks in a moment. Uh, the second pillar is about data sovereignty and trust. Um, um, some people argue that this is actually one of the most important pillars for, for a data space. Um, data interoperability can be solved, but if you cannot trust uh, the, the person or the organization that you're getting the data from, uh, and if you cannot set the rules uh, for uh, data access and usage uh, rights, then you really have a problem in the data economy. Um, so we need approaches uh, for that in, in data spaces, and this is what uh, the second pillar is all about. And then thirdly, uh, Claire, you already mentioned uh, business models. Uh, we have to make money. Uh, sometimes uh, this money is made by uh, sort of purchasing and selling data. In other instances, it is more about uh, having a traditional business model uh, uh, and combining that with, uh, with digital services. So you have another monetization uh, strategy, but you have to make sure that data in your data space is uh, findable, shareable, uh, and you can actually have that uh, that strategy, monetization strategy in uh, in place. Um, and this is what the third uh, pillar is about, about the data value creation. Um, so zooming in a little bit into each of those uh, pillars and the individual building blocks that we that we have. Um, Given the fact that we only have limited time here in uh, this webinar, I will try to touch upon some of the major points. And, and if you want to know more, I would uh, gladly refer you to the building block uh, on, uh, on our website. Um, so starting with data interoperability, again, it's about the capabilities that the data space needs to exchange uh, uh, data. Um, uh, both from a semantic point of view. So uh, do you have the models in place uh, so that one organization can understand uh, the other organization? We have the data formats in place and also the technical interfaces. So the APIs as they're called, uh, so that one system can connect to the, to the other one. Now it's very important to understand that the DSSC is not going to prescribe those interfaces and those APIs uh, or those data models because they very often are domain specific. Uh, so if you're in energy, you want to have data models on energy. And if you're in logistics, you want to have data models uh, which are on logistics. Uh, so in, in a vertical, you have to define them. Uh, but all data spaces will need to have approaches to set this up. Um, and to think about what are my vocabularies. Uh, and one of the things that we are proposing is that uh, a data space should have a vocabulary hub where you can store those uh, semantic models and exchange them with the participants of your data space. And also use this to map data models into data formats and APIs, which you can then use for uh, exchanging uh, data uh, in a technical way. Um, so these are the key elements of, uh, uh, of, the, of the first pillar. Uh, and uh, in our blueprint, we provide some, some best practices for, for this. But if you uh, ask the question, do you have the standard API for a data space? Well, that is not something that we can provide because that is domain specific. But what we can, however, provide you are ways of setting up those APIs for your uh, uh, vertical and for your own domain. That's the first pillar. And the second pillar, data sovereignty and trust. And this is about the capabilities needed in a data space to be able to, first of all, identify participants and, and digital assets that are there. Um, and immediately linked to that also the establishment of, of trust. Uh, identification is key. 
but not the only element of trust. So I can say that I'm Matthijs Punter, working at TNO, working here in the data space support center. But, well, uh, is it really me that is currently talking or is it an avatar? Uh, well, I can assure you it's really me. <laughs> Uh, but in the data space, in the digital world, uh, more elements are needed uh, for that. So maybe you need to have a trust anchor that can really indicate that this is the person that he or she is saying that it is. Uh, and that this data is actually uh, processed uh, within uh, a certain legal domain uh, or within a certain system. So this is really important. Um, but also from the perspective of uh, uh, the individual uh, data uh, provider and data user, uh, it is important to be able to enforce, to first of all define and then enforce policies for access and usage control. Uh, so if you think about data sovereignty, I should be able to clearly express uh, what are the rules, and what are the conditions under which somebody else can use the data uh, that, that I'm providing. Uh, and maybe these are certain rules that you uh, want to define on a data space level uh, so that they apply to everyone who is participating in, the, in a data space. Now, fortunately, um, there are now some common standards available for, for this. And again, I'll take you through this very briefly. Uh, for each of the standards I will uh, show today, uh, we could uh, talk at length. Um, but just to highlight that we have those standards in, in place. Now, for identity and, and also for the wider topic of claims and trust, uh, we see that many data spaces are currently referring to the W3C standard for verifiable credentials and verifiable presentations. And here in the picture, you see a simplified diagram of how this works. Um, so in a data space con context, you have a trust anchor. This can be, for instance, a data space authority that is managing a, a list of participants of, uh, of a data space. And as a participant, I can go to this trust anchor and say, here I am. Um, I want to participate in, uh, in, in your data space uh, and provide me uh, with a verifiable credential uh, that I can show to others so that I am can show that I'm actually part of this data space or that I adhere to certain policies that you have uh, have certified. Um, so this is a standard and, and it's it's really applicable to uh, to data spaces. So the holder can go to the issuer, get its credential, and then when he starts to exchange this data, he can use it and show it as a sort of a digital passport uh, to the other organization, which when in doubt, can verify that again with the trust anchor, for example, the data space uh, uh, authority. Now, verifiable credentials uh, uh, is not a unique thing. It's a common standard. Uh, and what we would like to suggest based on the discussions that we had so far is to actively use that in the context of, uh, of data spaces. Um, so this is what we are putting forward now in, uh, uh, in our blueprint. Uh, but we also understand that uh, more is needed. Uh, for instance, this is one of the standards that is also used in uh, Gaia-X, where, the, uh, where they use this for their uh, trust uh, environment. Uh, we have um, uh, the Data Space Business Alliance uh, also um, uh, adopting this in their techno technological conversions uh, work. And so we are referring to that to provide examples and provide ex architectural guidance as to how you can use this in your, uh, in your data space. Uh, but it also links to the business and organizational building blocks. And for instance, uh, if you define a certain business model or a certain governance uh, model, then this is one of the elements where uh, this will get a technical representation. Uh, and also, if you look at the contents of those credentials, I mean, W3C VCVP is a very generic standard. It can be used in many different contexts, but we should actually use the, 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 the concepts that we have defined in our conceptual model for expressing those identities. Uh, for instance, is this a participant of a data space? Is this uh, the authority of uh, a data space? And so on and so forth. So here, this is where the technology and the conceptual model will really come, uh, come together. Then data access and usage policies. Um, 
maybe a bit complicated diagram, but for me, it's, it's mostly to show that there is a lot out there that we can we can use. Yeah. And a very important standard that we are referring to is the ODRL, the Open Digital Rights Language. It's a standard that was out there already for quite some time. It's a generic open standard, it provides also a syntax for expressing data access and usage policies. Uh, so if you have a simplified uh, version, it would look like this. It can link you to parties, to assets, to actions. You can identify uh, rules. Um, uh, for the techies, uh, here is a little bit of JSON, but it's, it's, it's pretty simple. You can say, uh, I have an agreement. Uh, it has an identifier. Uh, and in this uh, particular example, if you look at permission, it will say that we have a movie. And that organization ABC here as an assigner gives a right to uh, another organization, in this case, the person Billy, to play that movie. This is a very simple example. Of course, in the field of data spaces, we, we need to have much more complex examples for those uh, rules. We also need to have a linkage between what's happening in the legal field and how we can express that using these kinds of, uh, of, of standards. Um, this is again where the conceptual model comes into uh, into play, uh, but this is a really powerful way to express your data access and usage uh, policies. Um, having said that, it's not only about expressing those policies, but it's also uh, extending this towards the operational enforcement of this. So how can you really put this into the technology and then uh, uh, enforce that also in a technological uh, way? Uh, that's still an open issue. We, we, we see some initiatives that try to solve this, um, uh, but others are already very happy if we can just express the uh, policies. Um, then moving to the third pillar, uh, it's about data value creation. Um, again, key capabilities, uh, money needs to be made, some data spaces. Other data spaces, it's just about covering the costs. Uh, or about uh, uh, making data accessible and findable. Um, and this is all covered in the three building blocks in the third pillar. Um, it's about providing descriptions of data, services, and offerings. It's about um, publicizing those uh, uh, descriptions in a catalog, uh, and maybe even create a marketplace where you can exchange those descriptions, and in some cases, even make money out of uh, the data offerings. Um, so I would like to underline that the way you are implementing this and the extent to which you need this functionality will differ from data space to data space. But in particularly uh, the data, the service and the offerings descriptions, this is something that we're seeing in, in every data space uh, today. And also here, standards are available. Um, and I would like to uh, uh, mention here in particular the DCAT uh, standard. Um, so if you have been involved in the, uh, the world of open data, this is the standard that the European Commission has proposed for open data for already a long time, uh, so that you can publish your, uh, your data set, you can describe your data set and make it available in, in catalogs. Uh, and this, they, this standard is now also becoming available for, for data spaces. And several initiatives have already integrated uh, this uh, into it. See a little bit of a complicated diagram. If, again, if you want to know more, go to our website and you can uh, dive into it. But you see the elements here. It's about being able to describe your resource. And this could be a data product, it could be a digital resource, it could be a service. Again, exactly the things that we have expressed in our glossary and conceptual model, but now represented in such a way that you can actually use it in, uh, in a data space. And whereby we can create additional links. So we can create links to the identity of uh, this particular resource of the organization that is controlling that resource. We can create links to vocabularies so we can express that a certain data set has a vocabulary so that the one who's using the data set can actually interpret it. We can create links to policies, as I described uh, a few minutes uh, ago, who can access this data, under which conditions can you use it. Um, and you can even bundle multiple resources into a single catalog. So you can provide links to multiple uh, data sources that are available in your 
uh, data space. So DCAT in this third pillar is a crucially important uh, standard for us. Um, and then you say, okay, but now I have three standards. I have nine building blocks, but uh, well, I need to implement this, right? Uh, and, and Claire, as you mentioned, a uh, building block is not one-on-one -on -one a software component, but at the end of the day, in order to be able to implement it, I do need software. Um, so, so we're building here on the work of the DSBA, Data Space Business Alliance, um, and several other initiatives that have also linked to, to, uh, to this. Um, and in this picture, you see uh, sort of an initial overview of the kinds of software comp components that you see. So, for instance, the connector, uh, a tool that you can deploy in an individual organization or on an individual system to really provide a gateway to the outside world for the data in that uh, system. Uh, the registry that you use primarily for identity and trust that you can say, okay, this is the registry of all the participants that I have in the, in the data space. And a number of other, what we call federated services, common services uh, that you can, can deploy for the data space as a whole. Uh, in some cases, you can deploy them centrally. In other cases, you can deploy them in a more federated uh, way, uh, but they serve the needs of the data space as, uh, as a whole. Um, and this is also a topic that we aim to explore a bit further as we move ahead from 0, uh, 0 0.5 to 1.0 for our blueprint. Uh, but also here, lots of things are happening uh, already uh, today. Um, again, a complicated diagram, um, uh, but let me try to simplify it uh, here. There's lots of work going on within the IDSA and within Eclipse and, and several other standardization uh, initiatives to really identify the control plane. Um, so in simple terms, I have a connector. Somebody else also has a connector. Let's assume that we want to exchange data with each other in the data space. Now, the first thing that we need to do is to get an identity. So I need to go to my data space authority or another trust anchor, uh, and I need to register myself so that, well, you know, I'm Matthijs and I have my connector and I can share data. Um, that's the first step. Then maybe I want to go to my vocabulary hub and look at uh, the data models that are available for my data space. So I can provide a link to the common language used in my data space and maybe by specific backend system, or I can implement certain APIs that apply to the whole of the data space. Maybe I can create a self-description of my data and put that in a catalog. And then somebody else comes along and can query that catalog and can find me because I've made my data available, used the standard for it. Somebody else can, can find me and my data. And well, maybe we need to exchange that. Uh, so the data services, data offerings. Uh, maybe we need to come to an agreement on the access and usage policies. Again, using the standards that we, uh, that we provide. And then maybe the other person really wants to check with this trust anchor that I am the person that I say I am and that I am part of the data space. And because I'm part of the data space that I'm adhering to certain legal requirements or legal frameworks. And all of this is what we call the control plane. Um, and all of these things need to happen before the actual data exchange can, uh, can occur. And this is then what we call the data plane. Uh, so the data plane will, will always be very domain specific because the types of data uh, that are being exchanged will differ from data space to data space. But this control plane, especially there, uh, we can come up with common standards and common approaches that can apply to all data spaces in terms of underlying standards um, and whereby uh, you just have to configure it for the needs of, uh, uh, of your own data space. And by the way, also this uh, picture I just showed here, this is also something where we are working with the community. It's not something where we have said we're going to reinvent the wheel. There is now uh, a group called uh, the Data Space Protocol. They now have launched ver version 0 0.8, and they cover this entire stack. And they are looking into how can we implement this in the context of IDSA, in the context of Gaia-X and other initiatives. 
And it's material that is available and that we, as a data space support center, make available to the wider community. So enough said. I already see uh, uh, some remarks uh, coming in on the chat. We'll have a Q&A and, and, and um, some further discussions on that in a moment. Um, but also let me take this opportunity to say that this is really a starting point. So we, we are um, uh, really putting this forward based on the interactions that we had so far, based on the great work that is happening in the whole uh, data space uh, community. Uh, and this is going to continue. It is going to be a continuous dialogue with our wider community. And we really hope in the months to come to further extend those specifications and further provide best practices and work with industry partners on this technological convergence so that we can really achieve the objectives that I started uh, today's uh, conversation with and uh, that also Boris uh, referred to. Uh, and finally, um, we also have the ambition to come up with a toolbox. So with uh, reference software implementations from our partners and other tools that we can make available uh, so it becomes easier to work with this blueprint and really turn this theory into practice uh, for your own uh, uh, setting. Now, if you want to know more, um, you can go to our website, dsc.eu. If you then uh, click to our knowledge base, that is where you'll find our blueprint. Uh, that's where you also find uh, the glossary that uh, Bert uh, talked uh, about uh, before uh, and the other materials. Um, uh, and please have a look at it. Uh, you can really click through to each of the building blocks and find content uh, uh, that is there. But also note that this is still a preliminary version. So we also included uh, certain remarks uh, where we said, okay, this is where we also would like to have a bit more input and your thoughts and suggestions. So if you have that, uh, if you want to have dedicated support, but especially also if you have something where you say, this is interesting and this is what I can contribute, we have our regular channels, community of practice, uh, for instance, um, uh, but we're also open to the wider uh, world uh, through our website. You can go there. Uh, and this is also the access point to join this co-creation process um, uh, and help us to really realize uh, the version 1.0 of, uh, of the blueprint. Um, so enough said, I'm going to briefly take a look at uh, our chat. Uh, I see we have uh, uh, a nice conversation there going on. Um, and I also would like to hand it back here uh, to uh, Francisca for uh, for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Martin. Thank you. Thanks, Claire, and also Bert and Boris. Uh, so yes, indeed, we have a very active chat today with many questions, and most of them are being answered by, by our speakers and also by John Franco Um, But there's one question that is still open. Um, maybe if we could go back to slide 18 to the uh, DSCC asset model, because there's a question, what is meant with standard? And um, yeah, maybe Matthias, based on, um, on the whole model, you could elaborate on that. Um, aha, okay. Uh, so uh, you, can you see the slide now? Yes. This was the, yeah. So um, uh, what is meant here by standard is, for instance, W3C verifiable credentials or DCAT, uh, common industry standards that are out there that can be used by, by data spaces, uh, whereby sometimes we need to uh, uh, tailor it a little bit. For instance, uh, combining those standards together or combining a particular standard with the conceptual model that we are uh, developing. Um, but this is what we mean by, by, by standard. What I, again, would like to underline and, and, and continuously reiterate is that as a DSCC, we will not reinvent the wheel again. There are a lot of things out there. For certain aspects, we aim to uh, promote the uh, technological convergence uh, process. Uh, I mean, there is ongoing work in the data space uh, community. Um, um, uh, but but yeah, we, we really like to try to refer to standards uh, as as they are out uh, out there. So hopefully that addresses the question. Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, then we have another one, and maybe Matthias, I could ask you to go to slide fifteen. So please 
next slides prior to this, and we have a question for Brad, um, whether we could expand a bit on the one and only one authority per data space. Um, so maybe you could take that one for the whole. Group. Yeah, <clears throat> there is this one-to-one -one connection from a data space governance framework to the data space and, and again, one-to-one -to, -one to the, the governance authority. That's because we believe that um, a data space rule set needs to be very strictly defined, concretely defined, and also the ownership or the governance of that rule set um, needs to be clearly identified. So who is that? Now, that authority can, of course, take very different shapes and forms. That could be one government. It could be one company. But it could also be an association, a collaboration, a cooperative, for example, maybe often not for profit also. Um, so And there could be multiple parties together participating in that authority. So don't see that as one single uh, entity. Uh, in, in most cases, uh, we see this is actually a collaborative between the multiple stakeholders who agree there um, what are the boundary conditions, the rule sets of the data space that they uh, set up. Now, there's another level above this, as I said, uh, there can be a federation of multiple data spaces. Now, that in itself needs governance again as well. So the end of that we have not seen, and that's why we've not published that level either. Um, and so that is still very uh, open, I think, how to define that. In the first instance, if you just imagine two data spaces that have a need to interconnect because they've been set up in an interoperable manner, of course, you can make direct collaboration agreements between two data spaces. And that would then imply that two of those authorities um, make specific agreements of how they would selectively open up uh, their data spaces for an exchange, which in itself might require yet another authority to govern that. Um, but that is all um, an exercise for later, I would say. At the moment, we were focused on one data space clarifying its governance framework, clarifying the authority of that framework. Um, and I saw another question as well. So what are the legal forms of this? Uh, like I said, they can be very diverse. They can be many. Um, as long as the participants feel safe and, and, and feel well served by that uh, governance authority, such that they uh, choose to participate, to join, to use the initiative, and to and to scale it, um, yeah, and 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 legally that can take very different forms. Perfect. Thank you so much, Bert. And uh, Matai, sorry, but as you are sharing um, the slides, I would ask you to go to slide number thirty-three because we have a question. Um, that refers exactly to these slides. Um, what does the dotted green line mean? So e.g. the connector includes all building blocks. Does that mean that the connector will eventually include all building blocks? Uh, maybe you could comment on this one. I think we have already answered in the chat, but maybe it's nice to elaborate on that. No, it's, yeah, so um, uh, actually, if you think of it, uh, if a connector as a piece of software that you can use to uh, access a data space, provide data, use data, um, then essentially it means that uh, there's a lot you need to do. And essentially it covers all the building blocks because you need to have in the first column, the semantic models and the APIs. And in the second uh, pillar, you have to think about uh, the identity and the trust. Uh, and in the third pillar, you, maybe you need to register this connector and the data it is providing in a certain, uh, certain catalog. Uh, so it's a technical component that has potential linkages to pretty much all of the uh, building blocks uh, that that are there. Um, so that is that is why why it is uh, depicted uh, in this uh, in this way. Um, we have a bit more detail on this on on the website, and I would also encourage you to uh, look at the DSBA technical convergence uh, document, uh, which also explains this in more detail. And it's also referred to, by the way, on the on the website. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. And now I have a question for Boris that is a bit longer and was sent to the chat at five um, and two minutes. Uh, it says, 
say I'm an e-commerce platform, say my data is compatible with another e-commerce platform, and they form an ecosystem and display their products um, and take fees on one another, and they have made their APIs compatible with, with one another and agreed on a set of rules, are they a data space? <laughs> so maybe you could answer that one. Yeah, the good thing is that we now have a glossary in place. And um, in the glossary, um, I should learn it by heart probably, but I, I think it's uh, talking about decentralization or federated things. So not one system, which holds true because you have two e-commerce platforms, but then I guess it's also trustworthy participants. Okay. And that is something that you should double check then if you have two e-commerce platforms, usually, I mean, you have some sort of identity if you log on because you always want to make sure that you sell something to somebody that is already able, to, that is actually able to pay. So that is probably also to be ticked off. I'm not so sure whether, let's say, um, data sovereignty is ensured in the sense that, let's say, um, the um, both the, well, the buyers on an e-commerce platform, but also the providers of, let's say, the product information um, have the capability to, well, to articulate under which conditions their data can be used by others. Uh, a simple uh, mechanism would be that I, I, as a, let's say, somebody who offers through your platform or through one of your platforms, certain kind of, well, services or products can basically restrict the visibility of certain items in my catalog to a certain user group, for example. Um, However, if let's say the possibility is um, um, is there to um, to constrain um, the use of the data, and use of the data might be, as I said, to to read it, but to process it, and to, for example, to forward it. If that is um, true, and all the other let's say um, uh, um, features that we put into the um, initiative uh, to the glossary definition are also true, then that would probably qualify as the constitution of a data space. Um, talking also about the data space authority, I mean, you would then need to align with the other um, e commerce platform provider on certain rules of the game, right? Um, which deal with interoperability, but also how you, for example, share revenue if somebody sells stuff that has been, let's say, accessed through your platform on a different platform. And these kind of things is something that that Bert just outlined in the governance framework. And it's good that it <laughs> would be nice if you only have one, because otherwise you would end up fighting or in front of court, right? And that is something that you do not want to do. So in case that, let's say, um, the um, as I said, the ingredients that we that we put into the definition in the glossary on the data space are um, are there. Um, that would, to answer this question, qualify as a data space. Perhaps a, a last comment because I feel that the question might stem from the fact: Do I have to build everything from scratch in order to build a data space, or can I also use existing applications? And of course, the latter is true because um, building data spaces does not mean that you throw everything away that you have, but that you integrate it into, as I said, a decentralized platform, which allows for data sharing under the constraints of trust among participants and under the constraints of data sovereignty. If your applications qualify for that, that's great, right? And then you basically can let them be part of a data space. Not sure whether that um, reason, uh, um, answers the question. Thank you, Boris. And if it hasn't answered the question, maybe you could uh, post the follow-up question into the chat. And um, then we have another um, another one which um, any of the speakers could take up, which is on the matter of data space use case and the connection to data product. Can a data space use case only be serviced by a data product or can it also be data which is not designed as a data product? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. whoever would like to answer that one. I can pick that up, but uh, yes, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be designed, of course, as a data product. Uh, the data product is also to stimulate the value creation, but it can also be in other ways, of course. Mm -hmm. 
And by the way, we we had to um, to laugh a little bit because we debated very intensively about the notion of data products. Exactly. Yeah. There is there is a lot of let's say different perspectives if, from which you can look into onto a notion of data products, and that relates to what Bert said. There is no, you know, it's not always an exact science. It's basically semantics and linguistic in the yeah. way. Um, so, and we debated a little bit about data product, which would, would that include, for example, data services or just APIs or, okay, if I have a data product, is that the end product that I pay for, or could that also be something like an intermediate product or a component of a, let's say, larger um, set of data? Uh, so, so you probably see that it's um, uh, and and a definition that comes along pretty straightforward um, usually spurs a lot of discussion. And that is also why the data space glossary is so so important. And I think Bert and Matthijs um, um, outlined that because we really try to, well, find common ground um, between all the different perspectives and notions about certain terms, which are all not wrong, right? Because everybody comes with their you know individual you know perspective and also socialization in the end um, but we as i said we we must agree if we want to build something that actually runs on a consistent set of of terminology yeah. but maybe if i can add <clears throat> it's maybe a good place to also say that not all the building blocks are mandatory Exactly. There are data spaces yeah. of various levels of complexity. So don't yeah. go home with the idea that you now have to fulfill and implement all these 15 building blocks for every exactly. use case. That's not the yeah. case, right? And and indeed, uh, there is some optionality in, in how exactly you, uh, you develop and implement uh, your data space. Yeah, and if I, uh, I mean, we should come back to the questions from the auditorium, but if I may add on what Bert just said, um, what we want to do in the next version is to also, well, as, as it was just mentioned, um, get an even more clear picture about what is, what is mandatory, so what you have to put into place for every data space and what is optional. And then if we basically combine or compose or configure, so to say, the different building blocks um, according to a certain data spaces needs, we might end up with certain patterns. And um, in order not to anticipate too much, but, but what, what we could imagine is, for example, if you are a data trustee or a data intermediary, you would basically come up with one pattern. However, if you are a data marketplace, which is just about to sell data, that might be a different pattern. Or if you just have, let's say, a data space for a, you know, relatively limited and known community, which just basically um, is exchanging data in, in data chains, that might also be a different pattern, right? And that would be something that we, you know, like to come up with in the sense, like, I mean, probably all of us uh, has prepared um, spaghetti al ragu or how we call it in germany a la bolognese <laughs> but there are different ways to do that right um and you know they always taste a little bit different and all are good but all you know are probably for different you know for different guests that you invite to your house <laughs> it's called like that and uh, this is something where we want to work on and also need your input from from the community because well you, you need to tell us what are the the needs, the purposes a data space has to fulfill. And uh, perhaps closing this comment with a very uh, yeah, concrete um, well example. Uh, I, I just ca came from Berlin from another data space workshop where we also discussed and so on. And there was, uh, what about this notion of a marketplace? And some, some of the participants, no, we can't, let's get rid of this because that sounds like we would we have we would have to sell all our data. I said oh, no, <laughs> you can just put it there, and you know. But it's you know, and you know, you feel these kind of notions is is um, yeah. It's it's very it's very very um, important to to come to find common ground, and um, yeah. Therefore, we hope that we will end up with these kind of patterns in the end. Yeah. 
Okay, great. Um, then I think I have a question for Matthias with, with regard to uh, connectors. Um, somebody's asking, there are multiple connector designs, for example, IDSA, EDC, and other Fraunhofer spin-offs. Is there an agreement to move forward with EDC? And now we're forgetting the TNO reference implementation and the true connector and uh, fireware connector. And the, so there are lots of connectors uh, out there. Uh, I would actually recommend everyone uh, who wants to know a bit more about uh, this landscape to um, uh, go to the website of the International Data Spaces Association. They have recently updated uh, their uh, uh, connector report. Uh, maybe we even have a link on that on the DSC website uh, too or maybe we can even add that, uh, but that provides some, some guidance uh, there. Um, to answer your question directly, uh, are we going to say this is the software that you need to use? Uh, I think the answer to that is no, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, uh, there can be all kinds of organizations that are implementing uh, software. Um, but what is very important is that in recent months, something else has happened. And that is that there's not only the uh, uh, the software implementation at Eclipse, but there's also what is now called the data space protocol, which in a way is a standardization initiative. So that if you take that set of standards, then ideally, regardless of the software implementation that you have, you can be uh, compatible. And we hope that the uh, Eclipse data space connector will implement that. I think they even already announced that. Several other initiatives uh, will do that too. And then we will will really end up with this uh, open market of, uh, of solutions. So for us, the most important thing is that the standardization initiative is, uh, is out there. And then hopefully through open source and commercial software implementations will, uh, will follow. But I see it's also triggering a hand uh, uh, with you, uh, Boris. So I think that is also the strength, of course, of what we do here, right? that basically it's free for everybody to take it up and build their own, well, software out of it right and that's that's the beauty of it because in the end that will spur let's say the uh, the adoption of the data space idea and the building blocks um however one thing needs to be taken into account i think we are all let's say true support well i think open source developments have a certain merit in our endeavor because what we try to do is to create an infrastructure that we do not only describe and specify, but we, which we also implement in code. And also due to the fact that we do not want to, this, want to have this dominated by one large vendor. And also due to the fact that in Europe, at least there is no single one company that is a capable and be willing to do it on their own we should team up because in the end we have to build the software otherwise we wouldn't be able to run a data space right so in this teaming up um should very much likely be happening in open source communities why because this allows well the collaboration in um, uh, generating software and the openness not only of the code in the end but also of the process is a trust anchor in itself. And that is a good thing because as I said, we create an infrastructure. So this is something which everyone should use and that is basically uh, not core to the majority of data spaces. So then saying that, if we want to do that, my personal opinion is that we basically would probably, will probably also find eventually that it's useful that the resources that we put in for open source development are bundled somehow, because otherwise we would end up like in, I don't know, 100 open source initiatives, and probably none of those will be really maintained and will really make an impact. This is, of course, not a recommendation of the DSSC, but I think there will be naturally some sort of development that people join forces and also in order to bundle resources. And we have in Europe seen that in other occasions, if you think of Fiware, Fiware is an outcome, a result of a large European program, which was started 20 years ago, which was by then called the Future Internet Enterprise System, FINES or FINES, or however we call it in Europe and with our, I don't know, 54 languages. 
Um, and out of that emerged Fiverr, basically, as, a, as an open source community. And I believe that, let's say, um, Eclipse, due to the fact that we have um, the Eclipse Association um, headquartered in Brussels, and many of, let's say, the, um, well, the companies that, that are involved in building data spaces are Eclipse member, as well as other, a lot of companies are members of Fiverr, for example. This is a good opportunity to bundle the resources to create impact. Because, uh, last comment on that, open source does not only mean to consume open source, which is always nice. <laughs> But you know, the funny part is contributing to open source, right? Because if nobody contributes, we won't have no open source. So, and that is something where we need to look into how we can make the best use of our resources once more. Um, there should be a variety, a market, also competition among these components, because competition is always good. But I think in certain to a certain extent, contributors will learn that they are better off if they, as I said, bundle their resources to create higher impact. Perfect, great, thank you, Boris. We have a follow-up question on that. Um, isn't DSP data space protocol also implemented in EDC for which, Catena X? Which protocol? Uh, the data spaces protocol implemented in EDC. Is that the case? Yeah, so EDC and Matthias mentioned that as well. Um, I'm also not 100% sure, but I think EDC implements the data space protocol. And that is also uh, the basis because that was mentioned for Catena X, right? And um, it's not, let's say, commercials or something, but just for you to know, um, Catena goes live in, what is it? Four days, 16th of yeah. October. 16th. And by the way, also not because it's not the only one, Matthias, you have been involved. When was it? Was it Friday last week or so? Um, the interoperability with SCSN has been assured. Yeah. And I think, as I said, this is no commercial or something, but it's just a proof point that these things that Matthias and, and, and we together elaborated are taken up and are actually working and are contributing to seizing the value out of data sharing. Perfect. Great. So I see in the chat that there is rather a discussion going on than more questions, which is also good. But maybe we can, with this, um, close this DSSC Inside Series. And Boris, maybe, or Matthias, Claire, I could ask you for some closing words before we then finish. Yeah. Who wants back? Do you want to start and then Matthias and Claire and then I take the liberty to, to close it? <laughs> no, so I think um, we're happy that we reached this milestone and apparently from the questions you see that it triggers the, the, the right level of constructive uh, debate. Uh, and that is actually the, the attitude we would love to see in the coming six months. And then uh, in, in springtime, we hope to... Uh, present to you a level uh, uh, version 1.0, which like stands firmly and has all uh, your input uh, combined. Well, uh, I, I would like to uh, um, uh, endorse what uh, Bert is saying, and it's really helpful also for us to have this input also and these discussions together with the community, because that will also bring our work further. Yeah. yeah, and I think we, we uh, building blocks is sometimes it might seem a bit uh, conceptual, uh, but yeah. we're now also uh, putting it into practice. And uh, uh, yeah, thanks for all the uh, warm uh, comments in the, in the chat. Uh, let's also keep this dialogue open and reach out to us uh, if you have any further, th further thoughts, suggestions of things that we could, uh, could incorporate. Yeah. Yeah, and also uh, perhaps as, as some final remarks, I think I mentioned it earlier on in, in many dimensions, establishing a data space is stepping onto uncharted territory, right? And there are no, I mean, what we can't do is basically look into 30 years of experience. Oh, okay, there are a lot of textbooks out there, how to basically build a data space that simply does not exist. And there is, let's say a lot of, let's say innovation or, well, novelty in terms of technology but honestly the more uh, let's say critical well, no, well critical but well sufficient for success parts are in the end 
well, also changing the business mindset to really team up to use data together. Um, trust can be supported by technology, but not to a hundred percent level. We have all ways of legal issues. You wouldn't believe how much, let's say, <laughs> regulation comes along. It's not only the data regulation that we put into place in Europe, which, by the way, has, of course, a good rationale, but also other things like antitrust law and these kind of things. So it's really, really a big animal. And um, I think how we did it now, and Matthijs framed it also nicely, is a preliminary version. And we were, we move ahead. So we basically incrementally improve and, and 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 make the result better. And we can only do that together because in the end, well, that's the spirit. And we need to get as much good input as we can get in order to work and come up with the best possible result. Saying that, I I also don't want to miss the opportunity to thank, let's say, the wider community but also once more thank the project team because it was a hell of an effort it was also a lot of fun and very intensive discussions and yeah i'm personally looking forward to let's say version 1.0 and also i would like to close with thanking Fran uh, francisco for organizing this moderating this and make sure that we had the seminar thank you very much and thanks to the audience bye bye Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.